With over 12,000 cards available for players to choose from, the majority of which saw their initial debut in the anime, you might be inclined to believe that every card from the anime has received a physical print. But the truth is, there are still hundreds of cards from the anime that have never transitioned to the TCG or the OCG. It's almost as though they're being kept hidden. Are these cards simply too powerful to introduce to today's metagame? Today, we're uncovering the secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! It's the home stretch, ladies and gentlemen, but before we get into the Waking the Dragons arc, we've got a surplus of miscellaneous cards to cover from the Duel Monsters era. Movie exclusives, cards that didn't relate to the subjects of the previous videos, and cards that I just completely forgot because I don't have a PhD in dueling. That being said, let's get into it. Starting with cards relating to the Virtual World arc, I forgot a card from Noah Kaiba, and when you hear it, well, you can't blame me. Ares, a level 4 light fairy normal monster with 1800 attack and 1400 defense. And I could say almost the exact same thing about this card as I do with every other vanilla monster that we've covered in the series. It's a decent beat stick and would have been alright for the release window if it matched up with the arc that it debuted in. Going into the big 5 as a collective, Altar of Mist was a card used to search the ritual spell card needed to summon 5 headed dragon in the most terrible way possible. A normal spell card which remains face up on the field for 3 turns, and while face up, cannot be destroyed by card effects. During your third standby phase after activation, send this card to the graveyard and add one ritual spell card from your deck to your hand. Look, I get that duels in the anime are scripted in a way to span a certain number of episodes, but for the love of everything that is sacred in this world, has the goof troop never heard of Sonic Bird? And our last card in Virtual World came from Gansley, as I completely disregarded the existence of Ashen Grey, a level 3 wind winged beast flip effect monster with 500 attack and defense. When this monster is flipped face up, your opponent discards one card. And when this card is destroyed by battle and sent to the graveyard, you can special summon one Ashen Grey from your hand or deck in face down defense position. Obviously not stellar by today's standard, as it is the case for nearly all flip effect monsters. However, I've got a personal love for this card because I used to play a deck full of spamming low level flip effect monsters, and this card would have been right at home with my Bubonic Vermin and Spear Cretan. When you think of the Pyramid of Light movie, most players recall Attack Guidance Armor and Deck Destruction Virus as the exclusive cards that never received a physical print. Attack Guidance Armor did eventually receive a physical import, albeit far too late to have any relevance in the game, but now we can talk about the three other cards. The first and probably second most popular is Deck Destruction Virus, played by Kaiba, a continuous trap card which can only be activated when a Dark Fiend type monster with 500 or less attack is destroyed as a result of battle. Send 10 random cards from your opponent's deck to the graveyard. This one goes against the norm of the Virus Trap Card family, but I do wonder if this would have seen any amount of play similar to the Virus cards that we already have. I certainly don't think that it would ever reach the prestige of the original Crush Card Virus, but it's a pretty good card. In today's game, rarely do you want to put more bodies on your opponent's board. There are far too many hour turn effects that your opponent can take advantage of, but Kaiba's last card from the Pyramid of Light movie seems to flip that concept on its head. Obligatory Summon, a normal spell card which forces your opponent to special summon as many monsters as possible from their deck to the field of the same type as one monster on the field that they control. And the effects of the special summon monsters that would activate at the time of being summoned are negated. This one is actually really intriguing, and I would go as far as saying that this would be a powerhouse of a staple card. The majority of today's meta-dominating archetypes have relatively underpowered main deck monsters in terms of attack power forcing your opponent to summon all of their Snake Eye Ash and or popular, and removing their effects now gives you what is basically a field of tiny vanilla monsters to crash into. This has a lot of modern application. Going into Yugi's sole inclusion from the movie, Reverse of Reverse is a normal trap card which you can only activate when you have no cards in your hand, and this is the only card you control on the field. You can activate your opponent's face down spell and trap cards as if they were your own. What a strange effect. I'm not even entirely sure how this could be applied in today's game. Aside from tier 0 format mirror matches, where archetypal back row fits with both players' decks. Because aside from that, there just isn't a whole lot of generic back row that is getting set these days. If at any time you told me that Anubis, the shadow villain of the movie that didn't do anything until the very end, had any movie exclusive cards outside of specifically Pyramid of Light and the Sphinx monsters that accompany it, I would have told you that you were wrong. Fast forward several years later and it turns out that I was in fact wrong. 
Fallout is a normal spell card which can only be activated when you special summon a monster. Increase the attack and defense of that monster by 4,000 points. You cannot conduct your draw phase, main phase, and battle phase for the next 5 turns. When was this used? I suppose it doesn't matter because this is bad, even for anime exclusives. But perhaps it was a card similar to the card played by Pegasus in Episode 2 of Season 1. Sun Shower, a normal trap card which destroys all face-up zombie type monsters on the field. And I relate these two cards because Sun Shower was never actually shown being played. The effect just kind of happened, ending the VHS duel. Fast forward into Battle City where there were four cards that I hadn't covered in this episode, and that's mainly because I thought that they related to cards from a different arc and wanted to cover them together in a dedicated episode. Once again, I was wrong. Death Hand, played by the rare hunter that dueled Joey just before the official start of the Battle City Tournament, was one of those monsters shown for a brief moment, but no card, stats, or effect was seen. Similar to Glass Man from Joey's Duelist Kingdom deck, this monster literally could have been anything else and it would have served the same purpose to just be destroyed with no further depth. Merrick has two cards that I neglected to cover, the first being Sacred Stone of Ojat an effect monster with unknown characteristics. Love that. That just kind of appeared when Merrick had both holding arms and holding legs on the field. It's about to get kinky. This card cannot be normal summoned or set. This card can only be special summoned from your hand if you control a face-up holding arms and holding legs. While you control this face-up card, holding arms, and holding legs, your opponent cannot change the battle positions of their monsters except by card effects. So, what's the safe word? Never did I think I'd be jealous of Merrick, but Brother is living out a lot of fan fantasies right now with my Valentine. And Merrick's second card was Nightmare Mirror, a normal trap card that can only be activated when an opponent's monster attacks. By discarding one card from your hand, the attack is negated and your opponent takes 1000 points of damage. If you're faced against the itty bitty direct attackers from the early core sets, this is fine, but in any other situation, Magic Cylinder is a far better option. And the final Battle City card is Ragnarok, a quick play spell card played by Yugi, which I would have bet my father's left nut because mine were gambled away, that the card debuted in Waking the Dragon, so it was in my best intentions to not include it in the Battle City episode. Nonetheless, this card can only be activated while there are any two of Dark Sage, Dark Magician, Dark Magician Girl, or Magician of Black Chaos on the field. Remove from play all monsters from your hand, deck, and graveyard. Destroy all monsters on your opponent's side of the field. As much as I despise Dark Magician support, I would have praised this card, if not for the asinine condition to banish every monster card that you've ever been in possession of throughout your entire life. What is that? The Bonds Beyond Time movie. What else can you say? It was a fan service crossover that probably less than 100 people total were actually asking for. It was certainly a thing that happened, and I wish it didn't, but we find three exclusive cards. Keep in mind I'm only covering Paradox and Yugi, and we'll cover the other exclusives when we get to their respective eras of the series. Yugi surprisingly brings us not Dark Magician support, but unsurprisingly mentions Dark Magician for no apparent reason. Dark Spiral Force, a normal trap card which doubles the attack of a monster you control. And Dark Magician cannot attack the turn you activate this card. It's fine, but the epitome of an anime exclusive that is likely first in line for imports to the TCG for obvious reasons. Paradox in recent years got quite a few support cards and imports for his Malefic deck, but we somehow missed two cards from the movie. Malefic Force, a normal trap card that equips itself to a monster you control. It is unaffected by the effects of your opponent's spell cards. So it's good, but like, why couldn't this have been an equipped spell card? It's not as though one is far more searchable than the other. Both subtypes of back row are very much subpar. Malefic Paradigm Shift, a normal trap card, is one of the many examples that ultimately has no reason to be imported to the physical card game, and let me show you why that is. Activate only when a Malefic Paradox Dragon you control is destroyed. Pay half your life points. Special summon one Malefic Truth Dragon from your hand, deck, or graveyard. It could definitely be worse in several ways, however, when we received Malefic Truth Dragon, it was given this card's effect as its exclusive special summoning condition. Doubling down on that is the last thing that Malefics need in terms of support. The Dark Side of Dimensions movie is another thing that definitely happened, and while I'd like to rag on this movie, it did give us a fan favorite archetype in Cubix, gave some undeniably powerful legacy support to Blue Eyes, which I suppose is a double-edged sword because Blue Eyes players are insufferable, and I got a new Celtic Guard monster, so it can't be all bad. 
Egami, the main antagonist of the film, holds one exclusive cubic card. If I've got any cubic players in the audience, let me know if this is your ticket to tier 1 status. Cubic Defense, a counter trap card which activates if a monster you control would be destroyed by battle. Make that monster unable to be destroyed by that battle, and if you do, special summon two monsters from your hand with the same name as that monster you control. Never mind, it doesn't have anything to do with cubics. This is pretty great though. Summoning from the hand is a bit tedious, but can you really call a plus one bad? Kaiba was well ahead of the trend of ARGs with the fever dream that was his duel with the virtual recreation of Atem. Hate it or love it, the future is now, old man. Time Chain, a continuous trap card played by the virtual reality Pharaoh, which is weird to think about in retrospect having never appeared before this duel. Anyways, this card's effect can be activated when a monster you control is targeted for an attack by an opponent's monster. Target both of those monsters, make them unable to be destroyed by that battle, and if you do, from the end of the damage step until the second standby phase of each player's own turn, they are treated as if they are not on the field. They have their effects negated, cannot attack, nor be targeted for attacks or by card effects. Destroy this card during your opponent's second standby phase after this card's activation. This is quite an interesting lockdown effect because it goes beyond the standard effect negation and battle prevention, but those monsters now cannot be utilized for extra deck plays. On top of the fact that this is in no way a once per turn effect, I feel like there must be some degenerate loops that you can pull off in combination with cards that summon monsters to your opponent's side of the field. Definitely a top pick for a card I'd want to experiment with and build a deck around. Regular Yugi is a bit more uninspired with Warrior's Devotion, a normal trap card which can be activated in response to an opponent's monster declaring an attack. Send one warrior type monster from your hand to the graveyard, that attacking monster loses attack equal to the sent monster's attack. Yugi, why do you insist on playing bad cards? It certainly fits a loose theme of his deck, and I can breathe a sigh of relief that it's not Dark Magician support. But all things considered, I would have been more interested in this card if it's specifically tied in with the Berry Magician Girls. Wrapping up the movie is the real star of the show, Seto Kaiba. I may not be fond of this movie as a whole, but Seto Kaiba has some of my favorite scenes in the sub. <laughs> We've got three exclusive cards, all of which are good and I'd accept more nostalgia pandering if we should finally receive them. Dragon's Orb, a normal trap card which prevents the effects of dragon monsters you control from being negated for the turn. Not as though generic dragon type decks need another buff, but this is a fun one, and at least unique in the fact that we're not focusing on negating your opponent's field. Enhanced Counter, a normal trap card that negates any battle damage you would take, and if you do, make one monster you control gain attack equal to the amount of damage you negated during this battle phase only. Based on the wording, I believe in theory that you could negate all battle damage if your opponent would attack with more than one monster, but when your opponent sees this, they're just going to end the battle phase. So, the best use would be using this on your own turn to ram all of your weakest monsters into your opponent's strongest monster to increase the attack of your own strongest monster by a ridiculous amount. I smell an OTK on the horizon. And finally, High Speed Aria, another normal trap card, and to activate this card you must send one normal spell card from your hand to the graveyard. This card's effect becomes that normal spell card's effect when that card is activated. You cannot activate spell cards during your next turn. The last part is a pain in the ass, but we've now turned any normal spell in your hand into a quick play during your opponent's turn, and that sounds lovely. I wouldn't necessarily see this card becoming a new meta staple, but respectable side deck option to pair with specific normal spells to interrupt your opponent. I was going to cover the Ceremonial Duel in its own dedicated episode, but you know, we're already here, so Blockin is a level 3 Earth Rock effect monster with 100 attack and 300 defense. And if a monster you control is selected as an attack target, you can change the target to this card. If this card is destroyed by battle, you can special summon one Lengard from your deck in face-up attack position. And Lengard shares the characteristics of Blockin, but swaps the attack in defense. And if you would take battle damage from a battle involving a monster you control, including itself, you can destroy this face-up card instead. Overall, a nifty pair of small monsters to mitigate some battle damage, and of course, being rock-type monsters, I am in full support. Ambush Shield is a normal trap card that is activated by tributing one monster. Select one monster on the field, and it gains attack equal to the defense of the tributed monster. It's a fun surprise for the opponent, but the setup needs to be spot on so that you're not just tributing a monster for no reason, which is typically too much to ask of Yu-Gi-Oh players. 
Bounce Spell is a quick play spell card that allows you to take control of a face-up spell card in the field and apply its effect as though you activated it. In the context of the ceremonial battle, this was used by Atem to take control of Yugi's Swords of Revealing Light, and that's about the extent of this card's power because continuous spells, the most adequate target for a card like this, are seldom used in the modern game. Even if it had premiered alongside the debut of the ceremonial duel episodes, it was already well past its prime. Ground Erosion is a continuous trap card which upon activation selects one monster card zone on your opponent's side of the field that is currently used by a monster card. You can send this face-up card to the graveyard to negate the effect of the monster in the selected monster card zone and decrease its attack by the number of your standby phases this card has been face-up on the field times 500. All meaning of a trap card is completely lost when it's best activated on your own turn. Because the send to negate is not a quick effect, it's only usable during your own turn and would have served better as a continuous spell and a perfect target for bounce spell, but it's a missed opportunity. Mirage Ruler is another continuous trap card that can only be activated when an opponent's monster declares an attack. During the battle phase of a turn, all monsters you controlled were destroyed by your opponent's cards. You can send this face-up card to the graveyard to activate this effect. If you do, return all of your monsters that were destroyed to the field and gain life points equal to the battle damage you took. Then, pay 1,000 life points as a cost. If you activate this card in response to the first attack, your opponent is never going to let the effect go off. If you activate in response to the final attack, you survive for another turn and can more than likely stage your comeback with the amount of field presence that you've now generated. I like this one. Mirage Spell, a quick play spell card, can only be activated when the attack and or defense of a monster you control would change by an opponent's card effect. Gain life points equal to the attack and or defense that would have been changed instead. The number of times that this will happen is fewer than the number of times my Ignites have won a duel post-Link era, and considering that number is a whopping 1, this card is not looking great. Summoning Clock is a continuous trap card that can be activated in response to your opponent activating a spell or trap card. Place one turn counter on this card during each of your standby phases. You can send this face-up card to the graveyard and tribute one monster to special summon monsters from your hand equal to the number of turn counters. I'm sure there's some madman out there that heard this card and has already formulated a protect the castle style of deck to gain the most advantage possible from this card. I'm right there with you. At the very least, when activated on your opponent's turn, you can get a large body on board for your following turn. But aside from the protect the castle playstyle, I'm not quite sure what the end goal of the deck would be. And lastly, Turn Jump, a quick play spell card that you can only activate during the battle phase. For the next three turns, each player must pass their turn. Also, do not draw during the draw phase. Six turns after activation, resume play from the battle phase. The PSET is suffering in this one, where it specifically mentions that a draw is not conducted, but the draw phase still occurs, I'm led to believe that every other phase still takes place, but things can't be explicitly done, like summoning, activating cards, and conducting battle. However, what is entailed for effects that would activate during certain phases? Would a treeborn frog still summon itself during the standby phase? Does a card like this now give you a free great moth? Has Final Countdown now become an even more degenerate strategy than before? Depending on the answers to these questions, this card scares me. And our final card of this week's episode has nothing to do with a ceremonial duel, but I wanted to end things on what is my number one pick for an anime exclusive card to be imported to the physical game. Matter of fact, I'm ready to fight Konami because this card just recently received a brand new wave of support and could have been imported alongside that support, but Konami dropped the ball, as is tradition. Heavy Metal King, played by Johnny Steps, a level 6 light machine effect monster with 2050 attack and 1700 defense. This monster shares the standard summoning condition of all metal morphed monster counterparts where it can special summon itself from the deck by tributing a musician king you control that is equipped with metal morph. And this new monster retains the effects of metal morph. Again, with the new metal morph updates in the upcoming Rage of the Abyss booster set, I could think of no better place for this monster to have premiered. And that was everything else for the Duel Monsters era with some extra inclusions. Next week is gonna be big. We're finally getting into Waking the Dragons, which has been the most highly requested and anticipated arc since I began this series. I hope you all are ready. Tell your friends, tell your mom, tell your fourth grade English teacher, because they're not going to want to miss this motion picture. 
But that's going to wrap up this week's episode of The Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! Let me know your thoughts. What cards would you want to see be imported to the TCG from this selection? Drop a comment down below. If you like the video, don't forget to drop a big thumbs up. It's greatly appreciated, as always, guys. And until next time, this has been Purple Pineapple TV. Signing off.